My name is Devin Zayas and I am an artist um, mainly in photography. I didn't really get into photography until I met my wife and she stated that she had a bad memory from remembering things. Uh, so that really sparked my interest in saying, okay, let me make sure I go ahead and like capture every moment I can. So it started off by getting a hand-me-down camera from my parents around three years ago. And then from there, my wife bought me my first camera on my birthday, like a, a lot newer model. And then since then, so I've been into photography for the past three years. It's more of a, it started off as a hobby, but now it's became more of a passion for me, really. It's like I travel everywhere with my camera and try to capture every experience that we go, we, uh, go through. What inspires me the most is to be able to capture a moment to be, and then to be able to reflect on that moment in the future. So, for example, like me and my wife, we will go through the pictures that I take and then really just reminisce in the memory of that moment. Remember the feelings that we felt, the experience itself, what we saw, because it's such one still image um, can't really express the whole entire experience, but what it could do is bring you back. So that's the biggest inspiration for me, is really just being, being able to kind of have something to track, trace back on for us to really reminisce about like all the happy times that we've had. Early on in my life, I was always, my father, he loved to draw and paint. Uh, my sister's a very good artist herself. So my dad got uh, me into art at a younger age. But for me, my, my passion for it didn't come until a later age because although I loved drawing and painting and stuff like that, it was more in either the school setting or doodling in, in class or whatnot. So, it wasn't until recent that I pretty much, it, I owe a lot of it to my wife because she has been a major source of inspiration for me um, in the sense that she too is a very creative mind. So she'll say, hey, I want to paint. And for me, I wouldn't have thought of wanting to paint if it wasn't for her saying, hey, let's go ahead and paint. And um, with that, it's the biggest inspiration for me is being able to share what I create, to really have somebody by my side looking at what I create and saying, wow, that's amazing, like, and really kind of cheering me on. Um, she's a major support system for me, and with that, my inspiration kind of grows through, like, with her by my side in a lot of ways. It might sound a little cheesy, but it's something that, it's the truth of the matter, you know? Um, and it's kind of with that, uh, so the inspiration as a whole for me comes from the love of sharing my creativity. So seeing how it affects other people when they see it. I started with a Canon 4D camera that my parents gave me and then my wife bought me a uh, Canon T5i, which is a lot up, or I would say a model that's a lot more upgraded than my first one. And it's pretty much, I don't get the same satisfaction I do with taking a picture on my phone as I do with taking a picture on a camera. So that's a big, thing for me as well. You'll see on my phone, I don't have very many pictures at all, but on my camera, thousands, all the time. I have my backpack, I have three lenses in my camera, and my GoPro always with me, wherever I go, no matter what. Even if it's just a simple trip up the road to Marina Bay, which, go figure, is an actual beautiful spot. <laughs> when I do my editing, I try to really maintain the image itself by only doing very minimal, um, uh, what's it called? enhancing edits so that it just makes what the image that already is just pop out a little bit more whether it's just a little bit of a color adjustment or a sharpness but overall it's very I try to do as minimal editing as I can because I want the raw just like image itself to really stay intact prior to really digging into this piece I it's one of those that I for me my photography comes from a lot from most of, like it's mainly driven through emotion. And so this piece in particular was more of a more feeling down, a little bit of uh, sadness. And what it represents is kind of, a, it's a city at night. You do see the light, so it's, for me, it's pretty much saying, even though I'm feeling down, it's still, I still have that light inside of me. It is dark and it is kind of isolated. There is no people around. It's a very just empty space. It's a, but the lights are still on. This was taken in uh, Boston when I was doing just like walking around the city at night, you know. It's kind of like 
thinking and just trying to really just bring myself back to a happy place. But during that time, it was kind of, yeah, it just I was experiencing a lot of like lower emotions. And there, for me, this piece, I also want people to understand that it's okay to feel down. It's okay to feel sad. And because at the end of the day, we're still alive. This image um, was taken at the Cliffs of Moher uh, in Ireland, and this image for me represents pretty much a breath of fresh air. So prior to this image, me and my wife thought it was a good idea to travel the entire country of Ireland. And prior to arriving at this specific destination, we were driving for over six hours, trying to like hit, just squeeze the entire country of Ireland into a week, like less than a week. So after just driving for hours, um, being tired, really not getting the full experience of what we were hoping to get, we arrive here and it was just like a breath of fresh air. When you see, when you see these cliffs, it is, it's astounding. It's such a beautiful sight. And for both of us, we love being near water. So being able to see the water and then seeing the, just like, just the structure of these rocks that were formed, just naturally formed, was, and then on top of it, the sunset was like a perfect addition to it. It was just all just a very peaceful, calming uh, moment for both of us. I love capturing uh, pictures of birds. The biggest reason being is they, to me, they represent the most free. Uh, they, they possess the most freedom out of all living uh, living creatures on this earth, in my opinion, because not only can they fly, but they can land on water, they can walk on the ground, they can go wherever they want, when they want. And this image in particular was pretty much, I was lucky enough to capture this where a bird landed pretty much just like it, when you look at it, it looks like they're standing on the water. And that's just, but yet their wings are fully lengthened. So it's like, you know, they're able to fly, but they're walking on water. And birds have always been something to me. My grandmother, rest, uh, rest her soul, she was very big into birds. She got me my first bird when I was a little, a little child. And since then I've just been infatuated with them because of what they represent to me. The advice I would give other artists and photographers would be never dream too small. Um, always be true to yourself in the sense that nobody has, nobody should have the power to say that your art isn't good enough. And it always, it all stems from believing in yourself first. And it helps having somebody to believe in you too, but trying to find that true inner inspiration and keep that because in this world where we're surrounded by so many things and so many opinions, of course there's gonna be bad ones, um, but there's also gonna be good ones. But the, neither side should really matter. It should, what should matter the most is what you feel, what you feel that your art brings. We are all born with a sense of creativity and it's, in the, it's really in the eye of the beholder of what creativity is and what art is, but to really understand that Art is something that we should all really cherish and to really, for, for my photography, I would like to people to really get a sense of like, wow, like a wow factor is like, these are amazing sights and kind of, in a sense, feel what I felt when I took the picture. I'm Jeremy Ackman, photographer. Uh, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Moved out here to Quincy in 08. Um, then I attended UMass Boston for undergrad. And then I went to, got my Master's of Fine Arts and Photography up at Art Institute, uh, Arts Institute of New Hampshire. A uh, small little school, art school, it was nice. Um, it was a low residency, so you only show up for like 10 days, uh, but it was really intense. <laughs> And then you get like a mentor, and that was really nice and helpful because you get to uh, follow or talk to a, a working photographer. So uh, I got to meet up with like uh, Stephen Dorado, um, David Hillard, uh, Cheryl St. Ange, and then Raymond Minks, uh, and they're all in this area. Photography is ingrained in my life. There's no separation whatsoever. Uh, I actually carry a camera around most of the time. 
uh, either it's my little Fuji or my iPhone, uh, even using Intax every now and then, which is just like a far away camera. Uh, so yeah, anything I can get my hands on. It's just uh, most of the photographs that you're going to see are just me walking around in the neighborhood or going to the beach with my family. So it's there's no distinction. <laughs> Everything's photographable of where I'm at. <laughs> Photography isn't like a, it's mostly an artistic endeavor. Uh, so there's no commercial side. I don't do anything. I actually make money in other ways that are not even close to being photography related. Uh, and that just helps, you know, with the art. So I just funnel that into the art because printing and bookmaking and all that it adds up. <laughs> even in the, the digital world. So even though I'm not buying film or paying for processing, I'm paying for other things. <laughs> other things show up. Um, and a big part of the, my artistic side is just making a lot of pictures of the day-to-day -day life of where I live with my family uh, and my surrounding environment because I think the two, you know, they uh, collide together. And I see how we, especially here in Quincy, that there's all this redevelopment. Uh, so we're like changing the landscape and, you know, my daughter's growing up in this new landscape and how is the world gonna look different from her versus how I grew up. And I think it's interesting and that's why I combine the, the two aspects together and, uh, and photography books mostly. I started uh, when I was in fifth grade, it was back in 95. Um, I had no interest to even know about it at the time, but uh, this lady came in and says, hey, there's a, we're gonna start a photography club. And I was already staying after school anyways, because our school had th these other after school, like baseball collecting trade things. So I always stayed after, and so I was like, oh, I'll stay after. And, see what this is and my dad gave me his little camera at the time that he had and they all we did was just jump in our car and go to places and photograph so I was like yeah this is fun uh, and then I didn't really I kind of did it off and on and it wasn't until high school where uh, I realized our high school had a dark room and a photo class and I was like oh this is there's more to this and so I did that and it was really fun and I was excited about it. And there's they also had a photo club, so just hanging out with all these older kids at the time when I was a freshman and sophomore, uh, trying to photograph and learn the process. So after high school, the only way, uh, it was pretty ingrained that I had to join the Ohio National Guard at the time to pay for my college, because it was, they would pay 100% of your tuition if you joined. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. My parents, you know, convinced me I had to do it. It was the only way if I wanted to go to college. So that's what I decided to do. And uh, and that's only once a month, you know, you have to show up. So I was like, and you can attend college at the same, during the same time. So they were paying my tuition. I went to Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, uh, and they accepted me into their Bachelor of Fine Arts program for photography at the time. So that's where I started and then I got deployed a few times and missed some college and then got married and then got deployed again and then moved out here. Uh, so college was not in the picture as much anymore. And then they signed, they, you know, um, after the Iraq war, they reignited the GI Bill and that I was like, hey, they're gonna, give me more tuition money, uh, housing allowance just helps pay for rent to go back to school. So I went back to UMass Boston for four years and I still had some time. And at the time when I was in UMass Boston, my advisor, uh, who I'm still pretty close to, we communicate back and forth, which is great. Uh, he's a art history teacher. And he mentioned, hey, you want to go get your master's degree? And I never even knew that was a thing. And that really ignited, like, hey, I, sh I could, there's more and there's more to it still. And I was like, so I was excited about that. 
Uh, so this first picture is, you know, just a simple picture of a cup on one of those uh, mailboxes uh, throughout the city. Um, this really got me more started anything about photographing the neighbor this, the neighborhood because I'm from Cincinnati and we had like neighborhoods and you just really just you drove your car more than anything. It wasn't a walking area. So I started walking more here, you know, trips from my house to the tea, stuff like that. And so I started noticing just these random cups, just like nicely placed, you know, not really littered, but like just gently settled down, you know, on walls, the sidewalks. And I just started photographing every cup, abandoned cup that I saw in Quincy. And I, I actually made a, a, a zine on it. Uh, just called Cup, Cup, Cups. <laughs> I like this picture. I, I always drive by it going to the Y uh, and this little guy is always out there. So I was walking by and I finally was able to photograph him, which is great because now Midas doesn't exist anymore. They, they knocked it down. So that also shows like a changing landscape uh, of what, you know, used to be here and how Quincy's changing. Uh, we're getting new stuff and we're knocking down older buildings and putting in condos and how that's going to affect our, our landscape and our neighborhood. Is it making it better, worse? I don't know, but we'll see. The famous tricycle. This isn't uh, my idea. Uh, uh, there's an original, William Eggleson. He's this uh, famous uh, photographer. Uh, back in the 60s, 70s, he's still alive today. Uh, he's out in Memphis, Tennessee, I believe, and he took a big, he took a picture in a neighborhood of a tricycle. So my opportunity came up; I couldn't deny it. This is really right outside one of my my uh, townhouse that I first lived in, Quincy, and it was just there, and I just ran out and took it. Uh, and you know, I, I don't see a wrong of trying to copy uh, another photographer's image like we're all influenced by these images and I just wanted to I had a shot to take my own so I did and it shows you know it's a different photograph it it relates to his but it also is mine uh, it's different different setting he had more of a suburb feel to his uh, this looks more of an urban feel uh, and cart and very busy area I guess in photography there's a lot of like grudges I guess like there's always these like fights you know like film and digital and color and black and white and what these two like you know things mean or like you're only this kind of photographer if you shoot film or whatever and uh, I think you should just drop all that it doesn't really matter I shoot everything I shoot on my phone now I shoot film I shoot uh, digital and I mix it all together uh, drop it who cares? Get the picture. Um, and, you know, uh, and also, you know, you don't have to go to exotic locations to photograph. Like, it took me a while to get over that. Like, I had to go to a beach or I had to go somewhere that wasn't home. And uh, I learned, that, you know, during my programs that, hey, they, you can photograph your family, you can photograph your close friends, you can photograph your cats, your, your, what's personal. And I think that's even, I learned that was more, uh, that says more about you as an artist than anything. Like, because it's more personal, so it's, 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 it's who you are. And instead of like going to go seek out like uh, whatever, I don't know, something else that's, not related to you in a way. Like there's distance, I think, sometimes uh, when you go tr do travel photography uh, or stuff like that, you know? Because you're showing like, um, just your, your travels more than anything. You're showing that place, not who you are. And I wanted to show who I am, you know, where I live, what how life is. And I think everybody could do that. So like, I wish I photographed my closer friends in high school like that was a, a subject, you know, and you can. <laughs> my name is Wendy Adams. I'm from Quincy, born and raised, lived here my whole life. I think I was born wanting to take pictures. 
I begged and begged my parents for a camera. And when I was about seven years old, they gave me a Polaroid land camera for Christmas. If you go on my website, you'll see my first picture I ever took because I took a picture and I wrote right on the edge my first picture. So it's on my website. You used to have to count to 60 and peel it off. I went to college for photography, the Art Institute of Boston, which is now part of Lesley University. But at the time, it was right next to Fenway Park. I'm not sure exactly what it is that drew me to photography specifically. Um, I have been exposed and influenced by so many photographers over time, mostly an artist as well. I love art. Um, impressionism is my favorite. For photography, it's just, it's so wide and expanseful. When I was in college, I did mostly commercial work where I worked in a studio and did, at, at the time, it was fashion. So photographers like that were the ones that I tend to gravitate towards. But there's creativity everywhere, everywhere you look. So it isn't really definite, not one definite artist or person, just in, all encompassing. It's just everywhere. I pretty much made the switch to landscape photography out of love. I love to travel. I love to look at the world. So trying to capture what you see in front of you and include certain elements that you really notice is such a big challenge. And I think that's why I've gravitated towards landscape photography. I still do do portrait work. I do that for money, which helps me travel to do more landscape. I love portrait work as well, but landscape is something special about it. And you do, you have to try and show people what you see and people see different things. When I do travel, sometimes I'm with other photographers and we'll be in the same spot. And it's always fascinating that we'll all get different images when we're all in the same place. And trying to get your message across on what you're seeing, what you're looking at, why you think it's, it's worthy of taking a picture and showing other people is a challenge. And I just love doing it. It has changed a lot over the years. Um, when I was in college, it was all dark room and film work, and you had to think ahead of time what kind of film you wanted in your camera. You were limited by the rolls of film that you had. Um, so you really had to think a little bit more ahead of time, and you had to get it right in the camera. You could change things in the dark room, especially with black and white. Color significantly less forgiving, so you needed to be really careful ahead of time. Digital photography has really changed the world of photography because you can change so much after the fact. And also, as mentioned now, there's so many more people that are very interested in photography, which has its pluses and minuses. On the minuses side, you see people who think that, oh, I can just do that, and they consider themselves a photographer. But on the plus side, there's more people that love it. There's more people that are interested in it. There are more people that want to try it and experience it and be creative. And you don't have to be a professional to be creative. And it's just such a fabulous way to express yourself. It's almost impossible not to be a gearhead if you're into photography, but it is, it is what you have with you. So for example, now, Another reason why photography is blown wide open is because you have a camera in your pocket with your phone. And over time, phone cameras have gotten better and better. And they're just easy to use. You can even go on, use apps and manipulate your image right then and there. And it's, it's very simple and fun and light. Um, I use Canon, I'm a Canon girl. Uh, when I graduated high school, my graduation gift from my parents was my first 35 millimeter and it was a Canon so I've stuck with Canon since. I don't think Canon, Nikon, one is not better than the other. It's the person taking the image and you can take a fabulous image with anything. Absolutely anything. I have some old cameras. I like to collect old cameras and one of them I actually found some film for and took some photos with it. This was years ago but it was fascinating to see the images I got because they were very dreamy, cloudy, and it just gave you a different look. So it's a completely different camera, but you still can take a great image. So I'm a firm believer that you don't need to have the best to do great work. 
three ways to simply improve your photography is to take a moment and decide what you want the subject to be. Cameras now, even phone cameras, even now will record depth of field if you have the newer phones, which is fabulous and it's so simple. So you just compose your image on what you're trying to say, what you want your subject to be and take the image. Another thing is to pay attention to the background. I think a lot of people don't realize what's going on behind your subject is critical. So be, take note of what's going on behind them. Another thing is light. Photographers tend to love sunrise, sunset, or those times of day when the light is just beautiful. Midday can be the most challenging. Not that it can't be done, or some situations it can be the best. But your light tends to make a big difference too. That's Boston Light. Actually, it's kind of a funny story because I was booked to do a sunset photo cruise that night. But it was kind of rainy, cloudy. They thought about canceling the whole trip. Thankfully, they didn't because we went out. It didn't rain. The clouds were so dramatic and so beautiful. So we're out there on the boat, and just as we're approaching Boston Light, some sunbursts came through the clouds, and I was, it was one of those moments I was holding my camera so excited because I knew I was gonna get a good image. That doesn't often happen. Often you don't realize while you're taking it, this is gonna be a good image. But the clouds in the background, the sun just magically shining almost on the light was just unbelievable. It was a great moment. In order to get the light inside the lighthouse, which can be very tricky, I time it out. I watch for it to light and then I count one, two, three, until it lights again. Then I get my camera all ready, I get my shot lined up, and when I see the light go out, I start counting in my head. And when you get close, you just start shooting. And it's another way why digital photography is fabulous because you can take so many and you, you get the light in a few. The second picture is West Quaddy Light, which is up in Lubeck, Maine, at the very northern tip of the United States. This lighthouse, I just love it, and it seems to love me because I, it's probably the best photos I ever get of lighthouses are of this lighthouse. Um, I was with some photo friends that night. We went out and you're in the pitch dark when you do night photography like this. So it's very difficult to see and to see your setup. In order to get the Milky Way, we were lucky because the Milky Way was out, first of all. Um, and you do like a 20 second exposure because if you expose too long, the stars get, the stars have motion and they get blurry. So I got very, very lucky with this image. I feel that I got very lucky getting the Milky Way that night. Some things that people ask me, I have this question frequently, is if it's real, if the sky is real, not just in this image, but some others. And yes, they're always real. I don't have the ability yet to change skies. I haven't learned how to do that. So that is what I saw. The third piece is um, from Cape Cod Beach, um, Coast Guard Beach on Cape Cod. I was there and it was a kind of a rainy, foggy day, which isn't always the best for landscape photography, but on the other hand, you get that soft, muted, pastel color, which I don't often photograph. Usually I tend to be very um, colorful, very contrasty, very bright. But this image just called for just nice, soft. It just reminds me of a nice morning, quiet walk on the beach. And I loved the pastel colors. I got the detail in the sky too, which another way I felt very lucky getting the detail in the sky. If you want to get waves, you can choose to do longer exposures if you want it to look more milky and soft, or you can do a shorter exposure if you want to capture the action. I tend to do a little of both and decide after the fact which one I like, unless I don't have my tripod. Because the long exposures, you need to have a tripod, and I do not like tripods. So I don't often have them with me, especially during the day. Uh, and you can also put a filter on your camera, which makes it darker, and that's easier to do longer exposures during the day. And the, the silky soft look to waves isn't something I do often, but it's a look that other photographers do that I absolutely love.